about the prediction or the, the right of the majority to vote, because remember that's what the liberation movement was about, the right of the majority to vote. But the conversation had turned about the protection of minority rights. And so, um, especially along the, the lines of race, so in terms of white, Indian, colored, um, and smaller race groups by demographic, um, questions were raised around um, not only race, but gender, ethnicity, and the ways in which people wanted to associate. And the, the reason why we ended up where we so are now. today is because um, there was a sense that if we did not have a, a representative system, <laughs> a system where people could um, have a proportional representation as opposed to first past the post and when it takes all, that you would never have a fair representation of minority groups. Now, that may sound like a noble ideal in a society that's trying to be inclusive, but it has in itself it's some fine. inherent tensions. Fine. One of the first Could inherent tensions. Hi, Simpiwe. Mm -mm. We can hear you. Hi. Please put yourself on mute. You unmute this app. Am I on mute now? You're fine now. Thank you. All right, when did I go on to mute? <laughs> Let's go. All right. So one of the inherent tensions that it raises is that it continues to almost encourage the idea of us um, associating around identity. Um, if we think about race, if we're thinking about gender, we're thinking about identity politics and we're making identity politics something, especially ethnicity even, something that we can rally around, as opposed to be thinking about ideas, ideas as the core around how we associate. And our history lent itself to us associating around identity rather than around ideas. And so we didn't create, I think, in that moment, the opportunity to allow the contestation, the political contestation, to be about ideas. It became about protectionism. It became about people fighting for territory. It became about a, a remaking of our history in ways that I don't think are helpful and useful to us. And what came about is that the, the subjugation of ideological battles. Um, and we saw the start to play itself out in the early 2000s where um, when the ANC started to have these threats of divisions and factions. And when the public domain, um, the question was raised, where will we find a black alternative? That's how you knew that we had set ourselves up to constantly have a society and a politics that is based on identity rather than ideas. Why were we in search of a black alternative rather than a new set of ideological ideas? because our associations had continued to be based um, around identity rather than ideas. And then what happens also in the early 2000s is the Fanzel Slabbert Report is released in 2003. And the Fanzel Slabbert Report basically was tasked with asking, is this the best electoral system? Is the system fit for purpose? We had had the system for a few years now and it could be tested. And that report clearly stated that there was a need already then for us to think about having a mixed system, a representative system, a proportional representative system, and a system that allowed for direct, um, uh, direct voting. And that would mean direct candidates. And I, I think the, 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 the Fanzel Slabbert report goes as far as really even tilting the argument towards direct away from proportional saying proportional representation should actually be the smaller part of our, of our arrangement and that direct should be the bigger part of our arrangement to allow flexibility, to allow for people to have greater sense of choice when they go to the ballot box, to allow people to have a greater sense of participation um, beyond parties. And the moment that we find ourselves in today where we now have the Concord judgment um, of 2020 and this judgment is absolutely crucial because the judgment really points out a few things. One is that the way the system is set up right now is that not only does it limit our freedom to associate 
to, to, to a group of parties. So you can only choose to associate with a set kind of entity, which is a political party. But what it also does is it takes away our ability to disassociate. So even if I'm never a political party member, when I go to a ballot box, I by de facto have to now become a political party member. I have to put my weight behind an organization. And many a times we don't know what those organizations stand for. We don't know what their manifestos really are. We have never engaged directly with those organizations ourselves. But in that ballot box, our ability to disassociate from those entities is actually just ripped away. And, and that's, that's part of the core of this, is the question about how free are we to actually decide on not only who represents us, but about which ideas represent us in the society. And when we go into the ballot box, um, are we constrained or are we free? And I think that we've been constrained for a long time by the political party system, and we have the opportunity to free ourselves. And the questions that we need to ask that I think my final panelists are going to engage in is what system of freedom are we looking for? And what the Concord didn't do, the Concord said that um, it is, it's, it's imperative that we allow for independent candidates to run, that they are not constrained by political party rules, they're not constrained by towing party lines, they're not constrained by the onerous financial requirements that it takes to be registered as a party, to, to maintain a party, to um, be on the ballot. And we can have independent candidates at all levels of our society. So some people would say, well, it hasn't worked. This independent candidate thing hasn't worked at the board level where it's been um, possible since the beginning of our democracy. And I would argue that the dominance of parties and the ways in which parties have the machinery and, and the, the, even the discourse that parties are central to politics have made it harder and harder for independents um, to actually get traction, even at local levels. And so it doesn't only take a change in law, it's also going to take a change in political culture and a change in the way in which society talks about why we get the people to represent us that we do. And so for me, the, the questions that we need to ask isn't about direct um, representation versus proportional. It's about what do we want our electoral system to deliver to us? And I would suggest we want the electoral system to deliver certain things to us. We want it to deliver accountability, where we can actually pick up the phone, go to the household, have engagements directly with the people who represent us, and actually get a response to ourselves. Right now, we can only get a response through the party. If we want something changed, unless we are able to enter a party that has representation, we are mum. We cannot do anything about it. We need the ability to have consequence management that comes from the electorate. Right now, again, the parties manage consequences. The parties have the ability to hire and fire. We as the electorate are just pawns in the game of how people get into power, but not necessarily how they get out of power. And the final thing that I think that it needs to do is it, in, it needs to empower citizens to participate. It needs to empower involved in the ways in which things work between the five year periods that we vote. And right now that is simply not happening. And there's no incentive for MPs, for members of legislature, even at ward levels and, and um, at local level for our representatives to actually hear the voices of people. And so it's not just a simple matter of let's have direct or let's have um, PR. I think we have a moment where we can invent a system that is fit for purpose for us that meets our needs. And the need in this country right now, and we see it by the waning voter numbers, is people who feel that they can trust their elected officials, they are heard by their electoral officials, they can have consequences and impose consequences when things aren't going right, and that their voice is part of the system of decision making, as opposed to just their, vo vo their, their, their vote being used to propel people into power where they then become the leaders of society, they then become um, superstars in the, in the social realm, as opposed to being hired by the people and where we can also fire and make sure that they do the job that we want them to do rather than that the political factions want them to do. So I think I'm gonna leave it there for now um, and allow for more discussion and then we can take it further, but I think Again, we cannot underestimate how important this conversation is, and we should not limit our imagination to systems that exist. 
but we need to think about what's fit for purpose. Thank you so much, Tessa, for your contribution. I mean, I think you spoke to the core elements of the judgment itself when you spoke about the rights of association and the rights to de-associate. I mean, what happens to an individual that's not um, linked or inclined to any political party? You know, they are forced at that moment to vote for any party so that there's just some sort of representation. So I think um, you kind of elaborated well on, on, on the core judgment itself about the rights to associate and the political rights. And I mean, you also touched on um, the electoral system at the time where the focus was on a representative system and reconciliation. So, I mean, what happens to those values? You know, are we moving away, for those, uh, away from those values? Do they still matter? I think those are also some of the things that we might want, we, we would grapple with now. You know, I mean, party politics have been formed around identity and ideology. So what happens now when we kind of move away from that system? And you also touched on the Fats Labbit report where, you know, there was, you know, a seek for leadership and direct voting. And there were also some recommendations there as well. But I mean, I think the, the most important thing that you mentioned was what system of freedom are we looking at? You know, it's, it's, you, this is an opportunity to, for us to kind of design a system that will deliver accountability. Because I mean, one of the fundamental challenges with the current system is it lacks accountability. So um, yeah, thank you so much for, for your contribution. Um, our next speaker is Paul Pillay. Uh, Paul Pillay will speak on the role and, and importance of independent candidates in a multi-party democracy and whether allowing independent candidates to contest national and provincial elections will strengthen um, democracy. And most importantly, whether electoral reform and the introduction of independent candidates will change the political and electoral participation, especially uh, um, among the youth. Um, Paul, over to you. Thanks very much. Um, I hope everyone can hear me. Um, I've got 15 minutes, yeah? Okay. Um, so hi everybody. Um, like I was said earlier, I'm Pearl. Um, I'm the Managing Director of Youth Lab. Um, I say this because I hope that it will then give you a sense of why I'm going to speak from the lens that I speak from, um, which is giving you a perspective on young people um, and particularly talking about how um, elections, independent candidates um, will affect the youth vote um, and where we find ourselves as young people in this political climate. Um, so I wanna start with a quick conversation about where we are right now. Um, if we think about the previous election that we had in 2019, we saw the lowest voter turnout since 1994. Um, we had more people that registered to vote. Um, so we had a big push of, of 18 year olds who were now newly eligible to vote. Um, and so we had a lot more people registering than we've ever had before. However, our voter turnout was actually the lowest that has ever been in our democracy. Um, now let's think about why that is for a second before we go into sort of the conversation about independence. The first thing I think we can all agree is that there's no faith in political parties right now. Um, as young people particularly, there isn't a sense that we have political parties that represent our interests, political parties that we can trust um, to carry the mantle for youth development, for addressing unemployment, poverty, crime, corruption, and the millions of other problems that we have in this country. What that leads to is the idea around representation that we have more than enough political parties. We could turn blue in the face talking about all the political parties that we have, but they don't actually represent our best interests and we don't see ourselves in them. Um, something that I enjoy talking about because elections are my favorite time of the year is election manifesto. So what I did in the 2019 election was read the election manifesto of every single political party that was contesting the national vote. It was a lot and summed it up for people on the internet because nobody actually does that, right? So we come from a point where we actually have a very thriving political climate because we have so many parties and so many options to choose from, but no one actually does the work of educating people around who are the political parties, what do they stand for, what does your vote actually mean? And what we found when we, when we looked at all of these manifestos and had the conversation about the parties that exist is that they're all basically different versions of the same thing. 
There isn't a party that is young, that is refreshing, and that can make us believe that there is an end in sight, that our issues can be solved, that we can put people in power that actually represent our views, and that there is a, an optimistic outlook for our political future. And that's what then leads to things like our very low voter turnout, because people think, I mean, what's the point of voting? Um, if you know me and if you've been following some of the work that I've been doing around elections, you would know that I didn't vote in our last election. And I'm not ashamed of it. I'm actually very happy with that decision. Because as a young person in this country, as a young woman in this country, I refuse to legitimize a system that refuses to see me and refuses to take my voice and my rights and my experience as a citizen of this country and make it meaningful. Right. And so as long as we look at young people as just voting cows and we look at citizens as just people that are there to vote when elections come, we're going to struggle in this democracy that we like to brag about. And so that's why there's a need for a good opposition. Right. Unfortunately, we know in South Africa, our opposition is a little bit of a crisis. There isn't really a viable alternative for us. If we think about the big two opposition parties that we have, they're both incredibly polarizing parties that have very specific ways of thinking and of being, and not everyone can find themselves within that party. They struggle with issues around race, around gender, around class. And like Tessa was saying, in a time where identity politics is the word of the day, we need to be able to have more representation and more meaningful representation in the political parties that represent us. And our, and our parties refuse to adapt to that very simple fact. When you look at the ANC leadership, when you look at the DA leadership, when you look at the EFF leadership, it's very difficult to find young people, edu like capable black young activists, women, people with disabilities, people in the LGBTI community. And so when you occupy all of those parts of society and you look at the people leading you and you find nobody that looks like you and no one that speaks like you, what are you supposed to do? And you're supposed to then legitimize that and fall into fall in line and vote and do all of those great things. Yet everything from the beginning points to the fact that those parties won't serve you. Now, if we think about a democracy, there's a few things that we really need for a healthy democracy. The first thing is obviously free and fair elections, which I think we can agree as in South Africa, we do pretty well with. The second thing is active participation of citizens. Now, this is a, a multi-layered conversation because it's not just participation as voters. It's participation in political life. It's participation in civic life. And so it means citizens need to have an equal opportunity to actually contest politically. In our current state, we don't actually have that. So if you're a regular, regular person who wants to contest politically, if you feel like, you know, you could be a ward councillor, you could be the president, who knows, right? Unless you join a political party and a very specific political party at that, it's probably not gonna happen for you. And so the move towards being able to allow independent candidates allows for that tenet of democracy to flourish because it says that every single citizen should be able to have an equal opportunity to contest political office. The third thing and the fourth thing that we require in a, in a healthy democracy is the rule of law and the protection of human rights. Now, if we think about those four things, I think we can say that with the last two factors, the rule of law and the protection of human rights, it's a little bit dicey. So if you're a VIT student right now, you're busy getting shot at on campus because the law doesn't apply equally to everyone because your rights to education and to safety and to be in environments of learning where you don't have to fear being shot don't exist if you can't afford it, right? And so all of those things link together to create a healthy democracy. If one of those things falls short, the whole, the whole cookie crumbles. And so it's impossible for us to talk about elections as if it's the only part of our democracy, right? And it doesn't make sense for us to not strengthen all of those other factors, but say, well, we're allowing independent candidates now, everything's going to be great. It just doesn't work that way. Um, and so what are the implications of those issues on voting? So part of the reasons why I didn't vote was because I felt as a young woman, the fact that I can't even go to the post office without being incredibly fearful 
tells me that this democracy is not for me, right? There's nothing here for me that I can vote and I can put a political party in power. But at the end of the day, my individual rights and the rights of other young women like me will always be trampled on because we don't have an, an electoral system that can deal with patriarchy. And so we have to think about the ways in which all of those things link together to create a shaky sort of voter participation that we have. We also have to understand that elections are a very small part of the, de the democratic process. Democracy is a continuous thing. Democracy happens every single day. Unfortunately, in the political climate we have, our political parties rest on moments. So a party disrupts a state of the nation address. We haven't had that in a long time, but that used to happen. And then it becomes a big moment that we all talk about. A certain leader of a political party leaves the political party and now it's tense because, oh my goodness, we didn't think he would ever leave and now he's gone, right? And all of those things work together to show us that if you think about democracy as a moment and not a continuous process, the electoral system you have is never going to be steady. And that's where independent candidates come in. Because independent candidates give us the opportunity to contest that space that says that democracy is continuous. When we think about, when I think about independent candidates, I think about the young people that at Youth Lab we work with every single day who live in different communities across this country who organize and mobilize around particular issues in their communities. They live their experience every single day, right? They're not sitting eating state money and then telling us about how they understand poverty because they don't, right? These young activists are experts in their community issues. They're experts in the solutions that's needed for their communities. And they've shown track records of actually being able to push their agenda, mobilize people around a particular message and actually galvanize support and make things happen. Why don't those people get the opportunity to be in political office? And so the opportunity for independent candidates gives us a really, really interesting moment because it helps us propel the young people that we see on the front lines of activism in this country every single day. And we say, give them a chance to actually run things, right? Independence also allows us representation. I think as young people, we speak very often and very widely about the fact that when you think about the ANC, it's a party of fossils, right? When you think about the DA, it's a party of white fossils. And I'm, I'm not even going, gonna go into the, the EFF because it is fairly young people, but they don't represent any, everyone either. And so independent candidates gives us the opportunity to say, here is somebody that I can see myself in. Here is somebody that I can put my vote and my voice behind. And I don't have to get bogged down with internal party politics, with factionalism, with patronage, and all of those other gross things that partisan politics has given to us as a nation. It also gives us a greater sense of accountability. Tessa talked about it um, in her input earlier, about the idea that when you sit with political parties, all of the accountability rests within the party. If a party decides not to recall someone, as we saw for many years with, with President Zuma, there's nothing as a citizen that you can really do. Independence allows you to directly hold people accountable because their loyalty is first and foremost to the citizens of the country and not the party which they represent. And the last point that I'll make is that independence allows us a sense of agency. One of the most difficult things as a young person is to look at all of these options of political parties presented to us and not feel like, it, like we have any choices. And it's the most contradicting, confusing thing to experience because the easiest thing that people say to young people when we talk about feeling apathetic, feeling like we don't fit into this democracy, feeling like we don't want to vote is but there's so many options, how can you complain? Just find one, find a smaller party. That takes away our agency because we should be able to say, if none of these parties are good enough, we need something new. And so this calls us for a question and a conversation around values, around the vision that we have for our country and whether or not political parties are going to take us there. I think largely we're finding that we have a big values gap in between what political parties claim to stand for and what we experience as citizens. 
we have a, a huge gap in trying to see where our country is going. We don't have parties that inspire confidence, that can make us look and say in the next 20 years, things are going to be better. And so the time has come for us to be able to move into an electoral system that allows for ideas to flourish and that allows young people the space to actually have power and actually take their place as political actors and not just as people who need to wait their turn. And so for me, I think that that is the cornerstone of what a healthy democracy is. When a regular young person who has no career aspirations for politics, because a lot of our politicians, you know, can't get jobs and so they choose politics. People that see politics and governance as a way to improve the lives of the people in this country. And we see that across all our communities, that there are those people that exist, you know, it's not this jaded, pessimistic um, viewpoint that exists everywhere. We do have people who are capable. We have people who can represent us and they shouldn't have to play the political party game in order to find that space. And so as much as I see that there are a lot of criticisms around independent candidates, for example, you know, people will say the ANC is such a big power. How will an independent candidate become the president, for example? But maybe that's not where we need to have the conversation right now. Maybe the conversation is about how to bring in independence and bring in a sense of activist politics into our communities first. Um, we have local elections coming this year, and I think this gives us an opportunity to test what independent candidates can do at community level before kind of thinking about the larger um, state uh, level levels of governance that we have. Um, so that's me. I think that's my time. Um, thanks. <laughs> Thank you so much, Pearl. I mean, that was a fantastic contribution. I mean, you touched on the lower voter turnout in 2019, which has like sparked debate around, you know, the push for, for electoral reform. And I mean, you also mentioned that the reason why we have voter apathy, particularly among the youth, is because of no faith in political parties. I mean, we know with the current um, party list PR system, politicians are more accountable to parties than they are to the voters or the electorate. So, I mean, and the other issue that you mentioned was um, no representation. I mean, you also spoke about going through the political manifestos and not, not really finding, you know, manifestos that speak to youth issues such as, you know, unemployment, I mean, gender-based violence, you know, like poor education, those issues that really, really are relatable to the youth. So why bother voting if, you know, that vote is not going to mean anything to you? And you also spoke about, how voting becomes meaningless, you know, when you vote for, for, <clears throat> for parties and they are not accountable to you as a voter. And then you come into where we speak about independent candidates, you know, now it's our time to, to seek an alternative. And I also like how you spoke about, you know, political participation is particularly among the youth. How, you know, does low voter turnout reflect, you know, a low political participation or, or a low electoral participation? You know, I mean, there's, there's a difference there. I mean, maybe the youth might not be participating in elections per se, but I mean, I think we might have our own methods to kind of voice our opinions per se. Maybe, for instance, political particip participation um, and for instance, the VET protest that you spoke about, you know, we have different types of, of political activism. And yeah, you also spoke about independent candidates, what they can do to strengthen democracy, like issues of more accountability and directly holding people accountable. So um, thank you so much for, for, for your contribution. Our next speaker is Musi Maimani. He will speak on the implication of the introduction of independent candidates on the upcoming 24. 2024 general elections and how allowing independent candidates to contest national and provincial elections and how it will affect the PPFA and PIA amendment. And I think briefly before he, he begins to, to talk about this, I think he can just give us a, you know, an overview of the one South Africa movement in terms of what they are doing to support um, independent candidates, just to so get an idea of um, their contributions to, to independent candidates and broader electoral reform. Over to you, Musi. Firstly, thank you so much uh, for the opportunity. And I wanna say good morning to everybody. It's, uh, it's great to be part of the panel and thank you for the inputs that have been given so far. I think it's been really good to get a 
to get a grip and an understanding broadly that we can create a common consensus as to what this moment means. I think I also want to say that um, to my vote counts, thank you for setting this up. I, I think one, it's one of the institutions that have come to respect and understand the work that you do. And, and I guess this conversation is about making sure that we answer the fundamental question, does our vote actually count? because if the fundamental debate that we're having is what happens at the NEC rather than anywhere else in our democratic space, then does our vote fundamentally count? Because then we might as well go to a conference of a ruling party and maybe our vote counts there, but it doesn't count anywhere else. To underpin that question, I think we have to be able to say what is the history that has brought us here? And if you understand, and I'm not, Tessa covered so eloquently the history of where the electoral amendment bill has come through. And the previous speaker covered perhaps maybe part of why voter engagement is low. What I would want to do without wasting too much time on history is be able to give you a context as to why this arrives at this place. The first is, is South Africa has a history of a contestation of some a degree of nationalism, which in fact simply says to the people of, of this country is that if you are transitioning from one sense of a colonialist system to perhaps an apartheid system to an African nationalism system, then elections in and of themselves are an expression of race and liberation as opposed to ideals and ideas. So that is part of the landscape that we've inherited. And it creates in and of itself the, no, the, the, the diminishing need for ideas, the diminishing need for credibility in candidates, because the meta struggle is that of being able to go, can we fight for freedom, whether it's from colonialism, apartheid, or what today we find ourselves in a space where we have an inept state that is captured. I, so I think we must understand that within that context. Second issue is because of that, we've never been able to imagine a South Africa that works for everybody. We've imagined a recycling. So almost what it feels like is we're waiting for the next cycle of nationalism to occur. And I would argue strongly that the first reason why we need independent candidates across the country is because we've got to break down the cycle of nationalism. So you ultimately end up with candidates who truly re represent the microcosms of their communities. Because if you get the right candidate, I would posit this idea that it is possible that a candidate can be able to stand in a community and for black and white citizens to be able to go, you represent what I'm about and I will get behind you that it is not a question of black versus white, but it is black and white. And part of the inherent reason to quote the previous speaker, a politician that left, I'm not sure who you are referring to, but I will get back to that in a moment. I left the institutional politics because I felt that the body politic in this country was no longer responding to the people. In fact, I remember having a conversation with President Ramaphosa on a walk in parliament and I said to him, President Ramaphosa, there's a gender-based violence march happening outside. Citizens are angry and I can promise you now you've addressed them and yet even from you, they were dissatisfied with the answers you are giving them. I'm only giving you a matter of time in a few years time. Those citizens will return and when they return, there will be no army or force that will be able to keep them at bay. Fundamentally, because perhaps maybe we watch parliament without the view that can give us hope or solutions to our problems. And that this idea of representation ceases to exist because we represent particular sectors of our society, not the ambitions or the issues that this country faces up to. And it was precisely for that reason that when I left, I said, we have to go build one South Africa. Because if we build a movement of one South Africa, we can tangibly argue the case that it can be a space where black and white South Africans can work together, live together and prosper together. If you want to achieve that, you have to be willing to pay the heavy price of saying the political infrastructure almost works to as an antithesis towards that. You've got to give power to independence. Secondly, as you have so eloquently described, 
that there's been a history that has brought us to this point of various judgments that have allowed us to give the opportunity for independence to be able to stand. Let me give a little bit of a quick critique about the poly political system. Not only does it represent a form of nationalism in our country, it also sets in and of its sight the intention to capture the state. Political parties in this country go out and say, because the 1994 consensus in some way said, we others will go run business, the political parties will run the state, and they will co-opt unions onto that and give pittance to the poor. Once that triangle is in place, we can ensure that those who look after the state only achieve that task while others effectively go create wealth. The challenge with that is that, that in that model does not infuse accountability back to the citizens. It means that the sole job of political parties is to keep that triangle working. So give above inflation increases to unions, keep the political parties in power, and keep businessmen running business. And so we never experience economic prosperity, economic reformation, and direct accountability to the citizens. So it's a facade to even propose that Amanda Gawetu or power in fact belongs to the people because where the citizens sit, it feels as though there's a vehicle that politicians are into that is taking them to their destination. So if the 1994 consensus was, was a better life for all, that has quickly transcended into a better life for some and really entrenching a fairly unequal society where in fact I would go boldly to say on this call that the voice of the poor is no longer represented in parliament, that politics becomes an elite exercise, a debate amongst the elites debating their own conversations at the expense of the marginalized, the ones who are left out. Nowhere in this country is there more vociferous conversation about poverty, 54% of our citizens live below the poverty line, that nowhere in this country are we having a proper conversation about how do we transition towns that are failing. The third issue I'd like to critique uh, party politics on is the fact that when it comes to the, mute, the capture of the state, not only do you loot it for corrupt purposes, but you also lessen its ability to be competent. So here you and I are sitting in this con call, I'm here in Gauteng, and whether I like it or not, the Val River has been polluted to a point upon which 43% of citizens who depend on water from the Val River are at risk of drinking contaminated water thanks to the failure of Mpule in the municipality and the multi the spheres of government. So once you capture the state, you entrench within the state incompetence within the state. And these are issues we don't talk enough about in the fact that if you were to look at towns in the Eastern Cape, there are towns today that are sitting without water. So how do you then say we've actually got a vibrant democracy that cannot even realize the constitutional imperatives that say you ought to provide for basic rights, whether those are water, energy, education, et cetera. So when it's said and done, on those three issues alone, the reason we cannot articulate a vision for the future is because we're nationalists in approach, we've captured the state, then ultimately the citizen's voice is left out because you've got an incompetent state that is still living up to its old consensus. So our vision is to fix the problems of yesterday rather than deal with the challenges of tomorrow. What we want to fight for and work hard towards, and the reason I wanted to address this particular gathering is because what one South Africa has set up is to say, if we think about the future, there are immediately two er three areas we need to correct. The first is obviously the question about education. So you've given me latitude to say, how do we work with education and transform it? Secondly is the question of entrepreneurs. But the third is about direct election of citizens. A work done incredibly by Michael Louis and has written a very important letter in the Daily Maverick today saying that ultimately we've got to ensure that when we introduce direct elections, that independents have the right to stand for elections, which is what the constitutional court judgment comes through, that we ultimately advance a smaller national parliament because I'm asking the question, do we have the best 350 men and women to run in parliament? That we have a transparent party list so that one day no one can be able to capture a political party, produce a list, and then you end up with citizens not knowing who the person is. When we talk about direct election, let us best know who the person we're voting for that we introduce a constituency-based system. And for the purposes of our reconciliation project, those constituencies can be diverse and can be multi-member constituencies, that it can be said 
that you don't need to be a man to fight for women. Uh, you don't need to be a woman to fight for women, but ultimately it's possible that a woman can be elected and can represent all citizens. That ultimately values is what builds society together. And that in those constituencies, people are able to rank and vote for people so that direct elections can occur. That ultimately you can use a single transferable vote so that you don't lose the proportional representation argument. And I can talk into the technicalities of how that works. And that you introduce a sense of electronic elections because in this COVID time, we've got to ask ourselves, South Africa, how do we lead for the future? So if we can be able to work on those elements, that's what one South Africa is mobilizing for. And I'm saying the party political system makes it difficult for independents to win because often they don't have resources. Secondly, they don't have the training. And thirdly, leadership cannot only be reduced to political parties. It is in business. It is in faith-based communities. It is in other areas. And how do we advance that? The difficulty is that they enter into a political say. It's almost as though you are asking soccer players to participate in rugby. And if you're not willing to teach them rules, help them understand how the game actually works and fund it, you always end up in a scenario where they lose not because they're not good or not because they wouldn't have the aptitude for rugby, but they've been poorly prepared and poorly trained. So we have to, we're offering training to activists across the country, giving them an opportunity to say, politics doesn't have to be about careerism, but it ought to be about the fact that these are people who have served in our communities in education, in, in entrepreneurship. These are people who have fought hard to build an inclusive society and that we've given them a values-based mechanism so that when they participate in election, they can work out the rules, participate fairly, compete well, and be able to win so that one day it can be possible that when we go to parliament, the best are there. The best young people are not in parliament. They are busy making money elsewhere or doing other things. The best talent in this country is not representing the people. So we have to work hard to reform the Electoral Act to achieve that. Uh, I will not go into all the technicalities as to what the bill could potentially mean, but I'm glad that on the table, the Electoral Reform Bill, there's already one report done by Ruth Mayer, already as one South Africa through Dr. Michael Louis have tabled one, and the Home Affairs Portfolio Committee under Aaron Mutsualedi has considered what they need to do. And so I think what the future holds, and I would hope this is the future we would desire, is that by 2024, when you go vote, you will be voting in your constituency for a candidate you know across all parties so that if person X is going to represent me, I best know who that person is. And then lastly, you can then be through a recall mechanism, be able to hold them accountable and remove them. I hold the vision that says that COVID has given us the great reset. It gives us an opportunity to truly reform the politics of our country. It gives us an opportunity to reform the economy of our country. And it gives us a basis upon which we can say, if we get the politics right, we get the competence right, and the capability of the state by having publicly elected people, we can truly begin to say we can build a South Africa upon which men and women, regardless of race, class, can work together, prosper together, and be safe. I cannot sustain a space upon which the minority are electing the government and the majority are not voting. We cannot sustain a space where citizens are becoming more and more unemployed, living in poverty, yet we have an economy that benefits some and others are left out. We cannot live in a country where walking in the streets is pretty much taking a risk in the sense that you are not protected. And yet we have this National South African Police Service that's supposed to serve people. And given the opportunity for how communities can participate, we can ultimately get the vision to reform the state so that it's lower down, closer to the people. And that democracy isn't just electing people, but it is also using that mandate to hold people to account. So to me, I think I don't wanna explain the pistons as to how a vehicle works. I simply wanna tell you, this is the destination of the vehicle. And we will live in a post COVID world that gives us a profound opportunity to reform our politics, reform our economy, reform our society, so that truly, when it's said and done, your vote really does count. Because at this point in time, it only matters when we vote. Okay, thanks. All right, um, thank you so much, Musi. Um, and also for briefly touching down on what OSA intends to do in terms of supporting independent candidates and providing resources for, for independent candidates. I think um, you mentioned quite clearly um, the issues with the current political system. 
in the class system how you know we've got a sequence of always you know bringing in recycling of leaders and the lack of accountabilities that comes with the PR system that we currently use. Um, we are going to be taking um, questions now um, from the chat box. But before we, we, go, we get to that, I just wanted to ask the panel if there's any response to, to any speaker on, on the panel before I take questions from, from the floor. There, there is a question here for me that says, uh, appreciate the good work you're doing. My question is, will one South Africa movement be able to overcome the hurdles of independent candidates along the lines of organizational infrastructure, inexperience and funding? Because look, let me give you a very real example. So if you go to a particular town and you are able to marry uh, the business community, the infrastructure of citizens that are there and the residents association you can rely really on section 15 of the electoral act to allow for residents association to give representation in communities secondly you can then sort out this issue of party funding by actually allowing people to directly fund candidates so as to build that and then thirdly we will be able to offer we can be able to offer through a school of governance training for those candidates oversight for what they do so that when it's said and done you don't end up with opportunists standing as independents and actually succeeding, but also you don't lose the PR vote in the respective town. So to me, I'm saying, let's go town by town, decentralize government so that it's truly closer to the people and make sure that, so for example, in Makana, you work with independent candidates to make sure they are accountable to the community, funded by that community. Also, we'll be able to give them the appropriate training, the values guide, how municipalities work, so that when they go into election, they're better prepared for it. So that's what we're doing. And I'm going across the country saying, let the best come and stand. We will train them, help them win an election. Because otherwise, if the best stand and they don't have the experience or they don't know how the new rules of the game work, then they struggle and lose. So let's assist in that regard. That's what One South Africa is working on. Um, thank you, Musi. There's another question. I think it's uh, meant for Pearl. Um, the question is, how is Youth Lab going to encourage young people and activists to contest the political space as independent candidates? That's a great question. Um, we're actually in the process of thinking through what our election work will be um, for this year. Um, it is a really, really interesting space because we, we have the opportunity for independent candidates. I think we would definitely do work around some capacity building um, and training of young people who are interested in contesting. Um, we, would, we would run something around that. Um, but we're still in the space now where we're figuring out like what all of this looks like. So if people do have ideas and they want to work with us um, on supporting young people who want to stand as independents, we're welcome and open to new ideas. Um, I think for us, our way of operating right now is number one, providing young people with all of the information that they need. Um, I think people know that the independent candidates thing is happening, but are, you know, are not sure how it works and what are the options available to them. Um, and so we would do a lot of work around education and awareness, um, and we would like to do some stuff around capacity. So we're always open to new collaborations and partnerships. So if people are interested, then hit us up. So, I mean, Paul, do you anticipate more, you know, participation among the youth with the introduction of independent candidates? I am choosing to be optimistic um, for this one because I think young people have been so frustrated for so long um, and that frustration of being young and being told, you know, you're inheriting this country and, you know, the liberation struggle was for you and you're the future, but not finding any way that you can actually fit into that, I hope would be a motivating factor for people to want to contest. Um, I'm worried about what our political climate might do to those young people, you know, um, as young activists in this country, we know that your chances of being shot at or killed or arrested, um, there's reports right now that someone at Fitz University was killed um, today, and that isolates 
you from wanting to participate in the political space because it's a very real fear, right? Young people have a lot of trauma. Um, if you think particularly about the fees must fall generation who carry very, very real fresh trauma from what happened to all of us back then, um, I think it would make it difficult for young people to want to take up um, that space of contestation. Um, but I think as youth organizations and as people who work in the, the youth development space, it's our job to provide the kind of resource support um, and provide guidance and, and just general solidarity with young people who want to take up the mantle. Um, so I'm, I'm choosing to be optimistic. I do think we will see um, when people understand the process a bit more and understand what are the options available to them, um, I do believe that we will actually see a rise of independent candidates, um, particularly because it is a local election. Um, and I think more people would be motivated to lead in their communities rather than contest a national election right now. So I'm, I'm choosing to be optimistic um, and we'll obviously do whatever we can to make sure that young people feel supported and feel safe um, if they do choose to contest. Um, thanks, Paul. This is a question here and I think um, um, I will direct it to Tessa. Um, the question is how do we reshape our political culture to open up ideas rather than allegiances to certain racial lines of political formation. This is the context of a country that is highly uneducated in nature. Um, I, re I recall that you said, Tessa, that you know, the voting has been around you know, ideologies and parties. So how do we kind of now educate citizens to kind of vote for ideas? You know, how, do, how do we educate them now going into introduction of independent candidates? How do we kind of change the, the culture and the politics? Sure, um, that's actually a really easy question to answer. Um, that if, you, if, if we understand how um, South Africa works on a day-to-day -day basis, when, we talk, when we're not talking about formal politics, but we're just talking about people's lives, um, people are always talking about ideas. They're talking about what's happening in their communities. They're talking about um, you know, very practical, localized issues that they're facing on a day-to-day -day basis, but they don't regard that as politics. So I remember doing some work actually with, um, with Pearl in, when I was still a youth and going into communities and asking young people, what are the issues that you face and what are the things that you would like to be dealt with? And they would come up with a whole range of issues, a whole range of solutions, but see that as fundamentally different from politics. And I think that we need to rethink what we mean by politics and, re, and, not, and not educate in the formal schooling sense but re-educate around what politics means, that democracy is about self-governance and people are self-governing all the time and not calling it politics. We have in, this, in the society, people who organize around protests or people who organize to engage at local levels and they don't call it po politics. And, and maybe an interesting example of this, um, besides I think what OSA is trying to do is the Patriotic Alliance. So I come from El Dorado Park, and in the last six months, the Patriotic Alliance has decided that the way they're going to um, engage with colored communities, quote unquote, is by going to act, um, active citizens, um, community leaders, church leaders that are already trusted in those communities, who are already doing things in those communities, and they're just going to go and support those people and give them a political platform. And so a guy who's been a community activist that I've known for 10 years, is now um, representing the Patriotic Alliance in the Johannesburg um, Ward Council. And so that's the kind of rethinking. Let's take the everyday that is happening in communities. Communities aren't just sitting around waiting for a politician to save them, but we need to start valuing what they're doing, teaching um, ourselves that the things that we're doing every day to shape our communities, to shape our lives, to influence each other, to resolve issues, um, I mean, one of the classic examples is the way we deal with crime in the country and that we have so many um, crime prevention forums in our communities. Those are things that are also part of politics. They're active politics, in fact. And we just need to transition that from thinking about it as some kind of voluntary benevolence that we're doing to an actual political space itself. Um, I want to link this to a question that was asked to Mr. Maimane, because I see everyone's calling him Mr. Maimane, so I'll observe protocol. Uh, <laughs> but um, the question that was, <laughs> that was asked um, around, you know, what will this look like? And I think what we need to remember is that we still have more than 12 months to decide what it looks like. 
what the judgment said was that parliament has two years to determine um, what the new system will look like. The Concord has not said this is what the details are. The Concord has just said that in the next iteration of this act, independent candidates must be able to stand. But we as society needs to tell parliament what, need, what needs to be in there. We need to mobilize, we need campaigns, we need to organize ourselves and get submissions into parliament that rethink and reimagine what this introduction of political candidates will look like. And I would take it a step further and say, reimagine other parts of the Electoral Act as well. If the Electoral Act is now up for grabs, let us determine what that looks like. If we do that, if we start saying, actually, this is how it works, issues around funding, for example, we, we, we must change the way the Electoral Act works right now in terms of how much money it takes and how much, what the criteria is for people to enter. If we do just that, we start addressing the inequalities in terms of big parties that can fund um, at mass versus smaller parties or individuals who don't have the same kind of funding. Um, Musi was talking about constituency base. Um, it, once you think about national elections, you think that a, a single candidate is going to have to get the entire country to vote for them. That's not necessarily what needs to happen. We could have a single candidate that only needs to get a specific constituency to vote for them, for them to get into parliament where parliament could then elect them as president or where we could actually, um, there are configurations we could figure out. But the point is that if you made that the catchment smaller, it makes it easier for somebody to run because they're not trying to get the whole country to vote for them when they're a single individual sitting in Kwajafonte. So there are ways to do this and we need to participate in creating the system. Thanks, Tessa. Um, there's a question, actually, technically two questions for Mr. Maimane. Um, is one essay an NPO? How does uh, how does one essay plan to sustain the work of supporting independent candidates over the years when they are not funded by the state? I mean, linking to the question is, will one essay comply with the PPFA voluntarily, even though they are not a political party? Musi. I think that if you're going to build a movement that's transparent, you can demonstrate that's easy to do and you can be able to check out who funds what and how they do. And even more importantly, you don't really have to even fund one essay. You can get behind a candidate. You can literally say, I'm coming to community X and I think we want to see our town change and we'll get behind the following candidates. Here's the risk, everybody. The big risk that we've got in front of us is that if we you know, people, if you think politics are the solutions to our country, then 26 year, years later and state capture has told you the flaws behind what goes on in that. Whilst independent candidates are not a panacea for all problems, but I often tell people, I say to them, one, accountability can happen. Two, it already has been affected. When you look at uh, this court case that took place in Costa, where people are then, they take the government to court, say, we demand to fix our own sewage, and then they do. Now, now they're losing the legal process to be able to do that. I have my own views about the dangers associated with that, but let's give people the political power to be able to do so at a much more localized level. Let's give people the right to be able to say directly they can do that. By the way, in the period post-election, obviously, like any councillor, any of that, they are supported by the council that they come from. They get a stipend, there's a, um, there's a process upon which that's all determined. So their sustainability is there, but here's the power. They can't move from those communities because they have to live there. What happens with most councillors at this point in time or often happens is that councillors get elected in the political system then they get famously deployed elsewhere and the community never sees them. Whereas now you say, you are based in this community. This is what you work for and your donor community is also from there because then accountability is felt at local and local level. So what one is trying to do is I always say to people, we become the Uber of politics. Uber doesn't own the cars. It doesn't even put petrol in the cars. What Uber does is that it gives you values. It gives you standards. It makes sure the drivers are people of integrity. And then you yourself as the community, as the passenger, determine where the Uber goes. And I think there's an opportunity here for communities to truly be able to shape their own local municipalities. And at national level, finally, and I'd say this, uh, I often say to people, when people used to call me 
uh, and call politicians who are in parliament, the net often citizens are the last call you take. You often take donor funders or fellow politicians before you take calls from citizens. I'm trying to invert that triangle to make sure actually pol political representation is firstly accountable to the people. And already our infrastructure is set up for that because from parliament, MPs are given constituency days and weekends and constituency offices and budget allocations. Unfortunately, what happens is that those things end up being used for party political purposes rather than for ensuring that services are delivered to people. We have to operate within already the current framework, but it gives us an opportunity to give power to what that framework uh, was designed to do. Um, thank you, Musi. Um, there's another question, I think it's to the panel. Um, after an engagement like this webinar, how do we as a collective set up pragmatic, a pragmatic model for mass mobilization of an active youth movement that is forward looking? Well, I I'll go first. I think. So we're all going to answer that one. <laughs> okay, um, Pearl, you go first. Oh, great. That was the last one, but wonderful. Um, if you don't mind, I'll also um, add in the question that came from Accountability Lab um, around whether there's a reasonable prospect for organizing um, around a, a youth voter platform. Um, so this is always a tricky question, right? Because it's very easy to kind of sit in things like this and be like, you know, the youth must rise up and do all of those things. Um, I think it's, a, for me, it's about starting small and simple. Um, when we start, you know, saying things like mass mobilization, it becomes something that's resource heavy and time heavy and requires so much more support than we might be able to offer right now. Um, I think for me, the one thing is for young people outside conversations like this to stay engaged, um, to ask the right questions, to continuously be part of platforms that um, give you the opportunity to raise your voice and to speak about these issues, but to also attach yourself to existing organizations that rip or that work for young people um, and, and formations that already exist. Um, one of the big issues we have in the youth development space is that we all like to do our work on our own because we think we're the only ones doing it well, nobody else does it like us, and we don't work together. Um, and part of creating nonpartisan youth voter platforms, part of being able to mobilize young people is to say what already exists. What are the community formations that exist? Where are young people assembling? Where are young people talking? Um, and I want, to, I want to say, so Accountability Lab asked about whether there's a clear demand, if we have evidence that there's a clear demand from young people to be part of the elections process. Um, and we find evidence of that by speaking to young people, right? So youth have done a lot of work um, around going into communities all around the country and talking to young people about what are the communities you would like to see, you know, what are the solutions you would like to have in your communities and what role do you think you play in making those solutions happen. And so that has shown us there's a very big demand for accountability, for representation, for participation, what we lack is support and capacity. And so being able to mass mobilize begins with finding formations that already work, that already have the resources and the expertise and the desire to do the important work of mobilizing young people. But it's about saying, what is it that I can offer and how can I bring that into existing um, formations so that we can move forward with our work together? Um, so a really good um, way of doing this to the person that had the question about what do we do is contact Youth Lab, contact My Vote Counts, um, contact Accountability Lab. I see they're in the conversation. They're doing some pretty cool work um, around holding public officials accountable. Um, but look at what is the work that's already being done and what is it that you have to offer to that work because it's only through working together and supporting each other and I know it sounds very hippy dippy and very Martin Luther King I have a dream but 
it really is that it's hard work. It's not as easy as standing on a soapbox and telling people, you know, let's all go vote together. It's not going to happen that way. We have to be substantial and intentional in the work that we do. And that only comes from building meaningful partnerships with each other. So my, my solution or my first step is find an organization that speaks the same language as you do, that has the same values as you do, that you feel like you can contribute to um, and, and, and do the work. Um, I mean, Lucy, I think you, you, yes, you, you can go. Yeah, like, look, I mean, in the midst of all of that, we recognize that in, in fighting for the Electoral Act to change, tabling the bill, now we have to collaborate, right? Like, so I think this, this already you've got credible organizations here, you've got one essay, and I'm saying, let's work together to do this. Because in truth, the reason why the opposition often becomes equally ineffective is because you've just got too many, you know, 50 political parties. And I'm saying, if we collaborate better, especially with the opportunity of independence and local government, whether it's with youth lab, whether it's with whatever, we collaborate. We get the best candidates. I have the privilege of having run a number of elections. So I have a understanding as to how the electoral process works. But we really don't need to think mass mobilization as it was in the 80s, where we can all end up in the streets marching. But all of us are activists on, on social media, on traditional media, in our communities. Tessa makes a very important point when she says that young people know just because someone is poor does not make them less in educated about their needs. South Africans know what they need. And if you read poor economics globally, you'll realize that actually people don't know what politicians are designed to do. And I'm saying the education is not just a question of saying, yeah, your needs. The education is about these people must work for you. And we can really, without surrendering the identity of respective organizations, frankly be able to go on this one issue we agree we agree on direct elections we agree on accountability let's build the infrastructure across the country get the best candidates and may they be young because all we need is all you need to stand for an election is an id and no criminal record so really the benchmark is low not that i'm saying we should stay to set at that it'd be helpful to get people to understand what's going on but we truly can build with them and, and bring the change that we need Um, so I'll just um, be quick with my response to this. For me, um, I want to answer Accountability Lab's question about evidence as well. The most important evidence for the demand for this is actually the ways in which smaller parties fare in our elections. And what we saw in the last election, we saw fewer people voting, but we saw a, a prol proliferation of new parties coming up and the parties that didn't get into parliament got about 500,000 votes. And so if you like divide it up into these, I mean, yeah, divide it up into these very small little minute parties. And when I ask the question, how did that happen? Um, even how did the rise of, for instance, the ATM happen? It happened because people want to be able to vote for people they know and trust. So those small parties all represent these little small communities of people who are saying, okay, at least I know this person. At least I can trust this person. At least this person has come to my door. I remember, I mean, for, for all of the kind of um, visibility that the EFF has, I remember speaking to somebody or, or a group of young people in a community in, the, in Pumalanga. And all of them had said, we've actually never met an EFF representative in our community. And just the idea that you can see and touch and feel the person who is that's going to be representing you is going to be on that ballot apparently appeals to um, a lot of voters. So we mustn't underestimate the power of um, what those small parties are teaching us about mobilization. And if those small parties became independent candidates, if they became that representation of what independent candidates can do, and they were working within constituencies rather than trying to get 50% um, at the national level, we may have a very different electoral system and a very different set of outcomes. And then the question about how do we make this practical? Um, I, I actually disagree to a certain extent with both um, Paul and Musi in terms of the 
the place of organizations in the formal sense of organizations as the key to this. Um, I've been thinking a lot recently about the UDF. And the one term that UDF people need to explain to the rest of us is street committees. How did street committees happen? How did they work? How did they function? One of the things that people talk about when they talk about the UDF is how it was a slow burn, how people had these street committees that were working, that were mobilizing um, un underground without being seen um, as an organization for a long time. And then once they, they knew that they had enough street committees across the country, they then emerged as a powerful force at a time that they had um, great repression of any kind of political organizing. And that for me, it feels like at the street committee level to take the kind of energy that results in so much activity in our communities on a day-to-day -day basis and organize it and formalize it, put out a toolkit for how a street committee works. Um, community organizers who address and deal with COVID. Why can't we do the same for political organizing at the street committee level? That's where I see some of the future of this line. Um, thank you, Tessa. But I mean, well, you still here. Yeah, I just wanted to, like, have we thought about the accountability of independent candidates? I mean, I heard you mentioning that, I mean, any, any independent candidate will not necessarily be responsible for, like, the whole country as a constituency. Maybe, like, depending on how we kind of demarcate the, the the country, but now how are we going to deal with issues of lack of accountability that, that might emanate from independent candidates? Have we thought about a system where we kind of have recall of independent candidates or some mechanisms to hold independent candidates accountable? Have we thought about that? Or... Sure. Yeah, um, sure. So actually, those, those mechanisms already exist around the world. There are different um, systems. The UK and the US are probably the most prominent examples where you have direct representation and you have localized ways in which recalls can happen. Um, and even just pressure to have people step aside is higher when there's a, a, a constituency base. Um, but for me also, we need to think about who is directly accountable to whom, right? So we can't hold independent candidates to a different standard that we hold PR candidates. In fact, the whole system needs to be designed as a way that even if you are coming in as a candidate representing a, a political party, you still need a constituency that backs you. So um, if we, because parliament already has constituencies, we actually forget about this. Every parliamentarian, I'm sure Mr. Mane can tell us about his constituencies that he was in charge of. But I don't even know which MP is assigned to my constituency. So for me, the golden standard is that every person elected in must serve a constituency, whether they're elected um, on a party ticket or they're elected on a direct ticket, there's a constituency that holds them accountable. The, the smaller you make the elephant, the better. Now that becomes trickier when you're talking about, for instance, the president of the country. That we need to think much more systemically about, but we already have processes in place for that, like the impeachment process. But the impeachment process will be amplified and made better by direct voting of MPs, if I can have the ability to pressurize a particular MP on the way that they need to vote in a potential impeachment debate, that completely changes the dynamics. So we don't have to have conversations about the two houses in a five hour discussion with X and Y person in order to put pressure on the president to do X and Y, when I can actually have direct access to an MP that when that vote comes about, that impeachment vote comes about, I can say, you either vote in this or that way, or in the next time I won't give you my vote, or in fact, I can recall you. So it actually makes things easier for accountability as opposed to harder. Um, thanks, Tessa. Um, Musi, I mean, you spoke about directly funding of the independent candidates within the OSA movement. I mean, now with issues of accountability, who are those independent candidates accountable to? And I mean, have you thought about um, accountability measures along, you know, as part of the resources of independent candidates within the movement yeah. or within, you know, the broader electoral reform space? What you have to do is always remind ourselves I mean, democracy isn't perfect, but at the end of the day, all of us must be, demo must be accountable to the people who vote for us. The problem with the party political system is that you end up with people accountable to the party, not to the people. That's why I want to endorse what Tessa's point is, which is when people vote in a motion of no confidence, 
the chief whip arrives and says to them, you'll vote in this way. And that's the conclusion of the debate. Whereas in fact, now, if you represent a constituency that has put you into parliament, you cannot lose your seat because now you vote independently. You're voting on behalf of the community that has put you there as a first thing. The second issue is when it comes to this issue of founding and, and accountability, you have to create the governance model in communities themselves that uh, to the UDF committees and all of that, that there's always accountability that sits with communities. We ask people to bring us signatures of how many people think you should stand in your community. Once you've got those signatures, those signatures don't just disappear after an election. It's the same people who must vote to say, well, I think Musi is doing a good job or not. And they can exercise the recall clause to be able to remove the candidate if the candidate isn't doing their job. Accountability should always be with the people first and foremost. The moment we, re, we send it to an organization, then you create the party political problem because then they feel that it, the community doesn't matter, but the organization does. So the last thing I wanna say is obviously all of this must ensure that we reform not only how the politics work, but how government in fact works. Because at this point in time, government is set up around the party proportional representative system in the sense that even in the allocation of resources, sometimes in the IDP processes, now we've got to reform even how that works so that the accountability is still back to the people and that actually resources are allocated in that regard. Um, thank you so much, um, Musi. We coming to the end of the webinar, and I'll uh, we'll just give you guys an opportunity to give your parting shots. And I think what you could um, elaborate on is what the responsibility we have now, you know, as a citizen, as a CSO. What do I do now? We're in a process of electoral reform. How do I engage with Parliament, you know, to kind of raise the issues that we have? How do I make sure that you know? Issues such as um, lack of accountability address with regards to the new electoral system that comes in. How do we prioritize the certain issues that we have? So I think I'll give you um, each an opportunity to to conclude and you know while also answering the questions. Um, well, I think um, I'll pick you first. You always pick me first. <laughs> Pearl, are you there? Well, I think we can move to, to you, Tessa, and then we'll probably come back to, to Pearl and Lucy. Just your concluding remarks um, about the conversation. I mean, you know, the role of independent candidates in a democracy. What are we looking at? You know, what are we envisioning? What are we anticipating, you know, having this change on, on our electoral space? Sure. Um, so before I answer that, um, Lukona Mguni made an interesting point um, on a podcast the other day. And he said that um, one of the things we forget is that when the president comes in and parliament um, elects him as president, um, he no longer is a serving member of um, the House of the National Assembly. And that actually delinks him from his party and his party's power. So the party still has power in the fact that, well, you know, in an impeachment debate, the party has X number of, of, of seats and X number of votes. But actually, legally speaking, he's representing himself. When he takes that oath of office, he takes that oath of office as an individual. And so his accountability technically lies with the citizenry rather than the party. And we need ways to not only formalize that across the board, but we need ways to actually enact that kind of power, that relationship that we have to that office, that relationship that we could have to every office of every elected person in the country. That must be the goal. The, the things that we can do at a very practical level is number one, um, take, take account of what the process is and what parliament should be doing versus what they are doing. The danger that we face is parliament kicking this down the road not doing this. We saw it with the, the Party Funding Act, and actually the Party Funding Act um, is another one of those things that's actually going to make this a better process. People have been asking, you know, 
Um, how do we ensure that um, independent candidates get funded? Well, they can get funded by individual citizens and by different interest groups, but now we can, we can transparently see who is funding who, which makes it harder for corruption to enter the system. So that shouldn't be a barrier anymore. But in the same way that that was kicked down the road, we must not allow parliament to kick this down the road. We must not allow them to get to a position where in 2022, when we're supposed to have a new electoral act, it's, they start applying for extensions and kicking it down the road. And then by the time it, you know 2024 election cycle comes around, it's just too late for anything that, that is there to actually get implemented. We must put pressure on parliament to keep to that two year deadline um, and make it. And then the third thing that we need to do is start having conversations in your community about what it is that you want from your electoral system. Start having those conversations at local levels, start putting together um, inputs and submissions that can go to parliament that start saying, this is what it looks like. This is what it could look like. This is what our community thinks our electoral system can look like. And I know that that sounds like something that people should be doing in think tanks somewhere in the sky. I assure you that's not what's necessary. Um, at, at best, organizations that are working in this space need to be doing voter education and creating perhaps some of those spaces where this thinking can happen. But everybody can actually start doing this in their families, in their communities, and coming up with what they think needs to happen. Um, it's, not, it's not rocket science to know what you want your participation to look like and to tell parliament that. And the cumulative effect of all of our voices is what's going to make the most difference at the end of the day. Um, thanks to everyone who's part participated in this conversation. And I really hope that this, one, this is one of many. I want weekly conversations about this to be happening until Parliament has that act amended in a way that serves us all. Thanks, Tessa. Musi, I, I know you need to go um, soon. Are you still here for your parting shots on the topic? Yeah. Look, I mean, I, as, as I say, I'm unapologetic. One South Africa movement is set up particularly for this issue. We're already hard at work in communities and really we're looking for more and more people to partner from faith-based organizations, civic organizations, et cetera, because I think we have an opportunity here. We have an opportunity of a lifetime to reform our politics, to reform government and take power back to the people. So I'm unapologetic about that because I think often people like to think we should start afresh, we should think, we should do all of that. I'm going, uh, uh, the, 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 time, the clock is ticking for two reasons. There's a registration we can schedule soon, has to be scheduled soon because elections have to happen between uh, August and November. If we miss that registration, we can, believe you me, it doesn't matter how many independents you run, whether you think it's a great example, forget it, it's not gonna happen. People are not registered, cannot vote. And then secondly, in preparation towards 2024, the par parliament has already, an, has already announced um, the, the, the oversight committee that is designed to set up for this is true of government, another committee, but Vali Musa is the head of it. Right to Vali, insist on making your submissions made because we can then, once we've done 2021 elections, focus on 2022 to make sure it's in play. And by 2024, produce amongst us here, I bet you already, you could have enough people who could be able to impact what happens in parliament and produce the best candidates going there, okay? Sure. Thank you so much. Um, Pearl, your parting shots. Sorry, I was sabotaged. I don't know what happened. I got kicked off. <laughs> um, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Um, so I'm largely covered by a lot of what Tessa said, um, but for me, it's, it's two things. The one is to reiterate the importance of staying engaged and supporting processes that call for input, that call for submissions. Um, Youth Lab does a lot of work with an organization called Youth Capital um, to put together submissions to parliament every time something happens. Um, and there's a big habit of pretending like, you know, young people don't participate and they just move things along without us knowing. We've seen it with the national youth policy. We are seeing it now with the NYDA board. Um, there's a culture of ignoring us. And it's really important for us to ensure that our voices are loud, that we're clear and that we, we, we don't let it rest um, even when it gets difficult. Um, and the last thing for me is, you know, 
what we're trying to do as young people who want better representation and better governance as citizens who are demanding a better country um, is not an easy thing, right? We know people love quoting Fanon, but we always talk about how the fact that power is not given, right? It's, it, it's, it's not like the big kind of established way of working is gonna go away quickly and easily. It requires a lot of work and solidarity work like this also requires high levels of trust. And so for me, I think the thing to think about going into doing work like this is to be discerning about who we trust to take up the mantle to do the work. Um, I think as the push towards independent candidates increases, as work around the act increases, we'll have a lot of new movements and new people that come out and claim credibility and claim that they have everyone's best interests at heart. But I think we have to be discerning about who we choose to represent us, um, how we choose to represent ourselves and, what, and have conversations about really what are the values that our work is based on. Um, and if I think if we guide our efforts through um, shared value systems and build actual communities of trust with each other, um, the work we do can go far. So be discerning, stay engaged um, and, and shake things up a little bit. Thank you so much to My Vote Counts um, for having us. I also really enjoyed this conversation. Um, and I hope that until elections come um, and even afterwards, we continue to have these conversations because if we keep quiet, things won't happen. Thanks, guys. Thank you so much to, to the speakers for, for your time and sharing your expertise. Thank you so much, Tessa, to, to Musi, and as well to, to Pitpel. I mean, you touched, I mean, Pearl focused on the youth, which was, I mean, the very essence of why we, we wanted her on the panel. Um, I know my vote counts will be doing um, a lot of work around electoral reform, so do look out for some or more of these engagements. Um, I know we'll be having another um, webinar next week on the PPFA on the 24th, you know, that's like in two weeks time. So please uh, make sure you interview RSVP. Thank you so much for, for your time and to the participants as well. Thank you for the questions and the comments in the chat box. Um, yeah, thank you so much, everyone. Um, it's a wrap.